Father, just thank you so much for this beautiful Sunday. I thank you so much for the opportunity we have to come together, to fellowship together, to worship together, to honor and glorify you in that. Lord, I just pray that as the worship team leads and as Pastor Barry speaks and teaches, Father, you'll bless all of our hearts today. The Holy Spirit will move in people today, Father. And I pray that we continue to honor and glorify you in the things we do. Lord, allow us all to leave here safely and come back tonight safely. And in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Welcome once again to Ebenezer Baptist Church. Let's stand up and we're going to worship and sing Christ is Enough. Christ is Enough.
is ahead of me, the Jesus way, in the chorus, we proclaim, I follow Jesus, I follow Jesus, he wore my sin, I'll gladly wear his name, he is the treasure, he is the answer, oh, I choose the Jesus way.
after we sinned, after we fell, after we separated ourselves from you, that we had no chance, we had no hope without you. Send in your son to die on the cross for our sins. We can stand today and say that we choose the Jesus way because Jesus came to this earth to live a sinless life, to show us the way. And God, when we sing that we choose forgiveness, when we sing that we choose surrender, when we, we sing that we choose love, we do that because of the example your son set for us. God, I pray that if there's someone here who's hopeless, I pray that if there's someone here that doesn't know who you are, I pray that today is the day that they realize that the Jesus way is the only way. There's nothing we can do. We can't earn it. We're not good enough. We never will be. It's only through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he, he showed on that cross for us. I pray that today is the day that everyone in this room realizes that. And they turn to you. And they turn away from their sin. And they can say, I choose surrender. I choose love. Oh God, my Savior, you're always be enough. They choose to follow you. I follow Jesus, I follow Jesus, he wore my sin and I'll gladly wear his name, he is the treasure.
Amen. That's my wife. So, so a little proud of her. All right, children, you are dismissed. Your teachers will meet you in the back of Children's Church. Walk, walk, walk. Thank you, Riley. She's mine, so I can say that. All right, let's stand and sing one more. Who am I? Who am I? here tomorrow night uh, bring your electric screwdrivers and everything we are going to take out those back pews uh, so that uh, 
if y'all get a little closer down to the front so I can see you, see the whites of the eyes. Uh, uh, fellow that wrote a lot of our music uh, in the scriptures uh, 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 that was present during the uh, American Revolution, uh, he always uh, uh, would make the statement, uh, he said, don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. And I can't see all the whites of your eyes, so I want to get a little bit closer. I tell you, we live in a wonderful time. I am so excited to be a part of God's plan for this age. I believe that we are living, I really believe that we are living in the end times. I don't know exactly when. I will not make a prediction when Christ will come back, but... Uh, let me just use an illustration. Um, when Jesus Christ was here on the earth 2,000 years ago, there were a lot of prophecies dealing with him. Multitudes, I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of prophecies dealing with Christ and what he was going to do on this earth. And he fulfilled many, many of those prophecies. Those Pharisees and many, uh, most of the Sadducees and the chief priests and, and uh, uh, all of those that were a part of the Sanhedrin, many of those, they rejected Jesus Christ because he did not fulfill the prophecies according to their expectations. And sometimes... They would ask the question, are you the Christ, are you the Messiah? And Jesus would, would plainly say, yes, I am. In fact, when he stood before the Sanhedrin, there on the night he was to be crucified, the next day, they asked him, are you the Messiah? Are you the one that God has anointed that he's going to send? And he plainly said, yes, you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, which is a direct statement of the Old Testament prophecy all through the Old Testament of the Son of God coming on the clouds, the anointed of God coming on the clouds. And he told them point blank who he was. And immediately when they said that, the Sanhedrin, the chief priest rather, the high priest, he took his clothes and ripped his clothes and says, we don't have to have any more testimony or any more witnesses because he from his own mouth has blasphemed God because he claimed to be God. But that was who he was. He made the claim and he backed it up by the fulfillment of many prophecies, by the miracles that he did. In fact, the Old Testament says that the Messiah, when he comes, will give sight to the blind, a man that had never seen his whole life. Not just cleared his eyesight up, but he had been blind his whole life and Jesus did that. And Jesus made the lame to walk again. He raised the dead uh, from their death and brought them back to life. We see that many of the prophecies about Jesus Christ were fulfilled, but yet they did not recognize him. Now, I'm going to use this as an illustration before we get into the message because I want to explain something. Um, let's suppose that you were home with your family and your family was sick, and y'all hadn't eaten anything, you didn't have anything in the house to eat for a few days, and your children were hungry. And the pastor of the church called and said, I'm going to send someone from the church, and they're going to bring you a box of food so that you will have food to eat today and tomorrow. And so you think about it for a few minutes. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. And you hang up. So you're anticipating the pastor has said that he's going to send someone with a box of food that is going to provide food for you for several days. Well, there's a ring at the door and you're thinking that's probably uh, the box of food or that's the person from the church. You go to the door and it's someone that you work with and they have brought you a bag of oranges. And you look at the bag of oranges and thank them for it and they leave. And you say, well, this probably is not the fulfillment of what the pastor has called me about. And then there's another ring at the door. And you start thinking before the ring of the door. You start thinking, you know, 
There's a lady in our church, Miss Johnson. She fixes the best chicken and dumplings. And she always provides food for those that are hungry. I know she's done this many times in the past. And so you start thinking, I bet it's Miss Johnson that is coming and she's going to bring us some chicken dumplings, some fresh vegetables, and homemade hot biscuits because that's what she does so many times. And so I'm waiting. I, I'm looking forward to Miss Johnson bringing those chicken and dumplings and vegetables and biscuits. Well, there's a ring at the door. You go to the door. And there is a man from the church that you hadn't really, you hadn't met before, but you had seen him at church. And so he introduces himself. He says, uh, I'm from uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church. And they hand you uh, a box of food that has flour and all the other fixings in it that you would need to provide for lunch. And you thank him very much. You set the box down on the kitchen table and you think, well, that's not who the pastor was talking about. Because the pastor said that they were going to bring us food. And I know it's Miss Johnson. I know that she's been doing it over and over and over. And so even though they, they brought this, it's not exactly what I was expecting. I'm waiting on Miss Johnson to bring her chicken and dumplings, vegetables and biscuits so that our family might have food to eat. And so the Pharisees in the first century, they had expectations of what the Messiah would be like. And so when he showed up on the scene, they didn't expect him because they hadn't studied the scriptures as Jesus said time and time again during his life here on this ministry or life on this as ministry on, his, on earth here. I'll get it right in a minute. And so they were expecting Miss Johnson with her chicken and dumplings and all they got was a man whom they had not met before, but he introduced himself and he gave them a box of food for all the things that they could look for and hope for to eat. But it wasn't what they were expecting. And so they crucified Jesus Christ because he was not what they had expected, even though he had fulfilled the prophecies that the Old Testament mentioned. And they missed him. You and I are living in the days that sure appears to be the fulfillment of many of the prophecies of Jesus Christ. But are we missing it because we're expecting it to come exactly? I know a lot of people expect the rapture. In fact, I talked to a fella. He came visiting from one of our churches before that I had served. and He came to our house, he and his wife and some friends. and The uh, six of us sat around this past Friday, and he explained, oh, yeah, uh, yeah our preacher, he, he teaches, and our Sunday school teacher teaches that the rapture is the, the very next thing on the prophetic calendar, and therefore we're waiting on the rapture. We're not worried about all the things that's going on in the world because we know we're going to be taken out of here. And... Now, I want most of you to realize that for the last uh, 68 years of my life, most of that time, I have been spent studying the scriptures. And my dad was a firm believer in the pre-trib rapture. And I expected those events to take place. In fact, I got saved. Well, I don't get saved. But I, I really got involved in reading the scriptures by leading, reading Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and his book called uh, Satan is Alive and Well and Living on Planet Earth. I even remember back in when I was teaching school out at Piedmont that uh, there was a little book uh, uh, by a Wisnet guy that uh, uh, wrote 88 Reasons, or no, excuse me, uh, Christ Will Return in 1988. They had another book that says uh, 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Return. And so there was a lot of people talking about that, a lot of discussion about that. And then it just faded off because nothing happened. You see, when we look at the scriptures with a preconceived idea, and we think this is the way God has decided it's going to be, and when I read scripture, I try to fit the scripture into what I believe, then many times, just like those first century Pharisees, they missed our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because he didn't fit what they thought. He fit the scriptures perfectly. He fulfilled one, every jot and every tittle of the scriptures. In fact, Jesus says, I have not come to destroy the law. 
but that the law might be fulfilled. And he did that to a T. But it wasn't what they were expecting. And many times we as Christians, we come to the idea that thinking, I have already decided how this is going to end. I know. And so we stop reading scripture, especially scripture that doesn't fit our context of what we think Christ is going to do at the return. So one of the things that I like to do is especially talk about not only the coming events, but I like to sort of look at the ideas of things that are happening in the world today and from that be able to say... Now, some people say, and I know this is a quote, a lot, I've heard this at least a hundred times throughout my ministry, if not more. They said, no one knows when Jesus Christ will come back. He's going to come back as a thief in the night. You ever heard that? The scripture does not say that for the Christian. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5, the first part of chapter 5, it says just the opposite. It says, for the large portion of the world that are unsuspecting, that have no clue about the return of Jesus Christ, they will be called as Jesus Christ comes back, he will come back as a thief in the night because they are not expecting him. But then, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, it says that you and I, if you are children of the light, you will know that it's close. And they even, Paul uses the illustration, he says, just as a woman expecting a child knows, she does not know the exact due date, but she knows that it's about nine months later and now it is. She's at the time. It could come any time or it could be three or four weeks away. A lot of times we read the scriptures or we hear the pastor say something and we say, well, my pastor said it, it's got to be right. I want you to do something for me. Don't take anything I say as correct unless it agrees with the Word of God. You are a student of the Word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. You and I, if you've been a Christian for... Now, if you're a young Christian, that's a different story. But if you and I have been Christians for 40 or... All, actually, I've been a Christian for 51 years or so now. And so, well, actually more than that. But if we, know what a, if we know what the Bible says and we've been a Christian for a long time, we should know what the Bible says. And we are sons of the light and we ought to have an idea when Christ is going to return. Now, I know there's a, if you go down to the bookstore or if you go online and look for prophecy books, you'll find hundreds and probably thousands of different ideas about the coming of Jesus Christ. There's only one book that you really need to study over and over and over, and that's His Word, the Word of God. But most Christians don't open the Word of God. They'll listen to a preacher on the radio. They'll listen to their pastor at, at uh, Ebenezer or wherever it may be. And it's good to have Brian and his family missed uh, um, uh, uh, Oh, man. Uh, Miss Bessie, I couldn't think of your name. Uh, they, they've come and joined her today. They're from Raleigh. And uh, I think they're going to the uh, uh, game tonight and see the Hornets play. I asked Miss Bessie if she was going to see the Hornets. Oh, no, I don't watch basketball. She says... I like the Braves, so uh, I can go along with that. I like the A shirts, you know. Somebody said, oh, that A stands for Atlanta. It could be uh, Alabama. I said, no, that A stands for Alpha, uh, beginning and the end, Alpha and the Omega. So I always use uh, that T-shirt to uh, uh, use it as a testimony. But anyway, what, how did I get on that? Oh, it's good to have you all with us today. Anyone else visiting here for the, anyone here for the very first time? I haven't met you yet. Anyone? We've got some other guests that are with us. It's good to have each of you back. But here's the, the idea. I was going to start tonight in my little yellow book. But 
because next Sunday night we're going to have the derby at 5 o'clock and food to eat, and I know that a lot of people might uh, choose the food over this type of food, I'm going to give an introduction tonight, but I'm also going to give uh, sort of a, a timeline of events in the scriptures, and also we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of my series that I'm going to be preaching from in the next few weeks. So we'll start this two weeks from tonight on the 21st, but I will give you, let's see, Barry Williams, is he here today? I don't see Barry, I didn't see him. Um, I gave him a copy, he wanted some scriptures to memorize, so I gave him a copy of the, the scriptures that I have here, and he started memorizing those, even though he's in the choir, and, and I'm going to put in a plug, I know I want you in Bible study, but I also know that singing is a part of our worship. And so I'll put a plug. If you've got, and I like what Steve said, you don't even have to sing um, pretty. Because praise the Lord, that includes me. Uh, my dad said the only bird he knows that can't sing is a buzzard, and that's what he called himself, the bird. You get it? Y'all were supposed to laugh when I, but that's all right. That's all right. Um, you'll get it later on maybe. But singing is a very important way of focusing our spirit on God and his word. If you remember when David sang or played the instrument before Saul, who had an evil spirit, it said the scripture said that when David played, the evil spirit departed from him. The evil spirit does not like to listen to God's message in song. In fact, the Old Testament is to be given as, uh, especially the book of Psalms, is a song book. And those songs are great there. So singing is a very important part of our worship service. So if you can come tonight at 5 o'clock, be here for the choir, that's great. Zach and I were able to be this week. We talk, I talked with him, I guess it was a Tuesday, I think we met, and... Um, uh, probably three hours or something. And so we talked a lot about future things. I'm not going to announce anything now. But down the road, we're going to open up some other things that hopefully will be of interest to you. Because I believe that we are living in the times that Jesus Christ may return within our lifetime. And if that's the case, we need to be sons of the light. We need to know the scriptures. We need to be prepared for what's coming. It may not be exactly what you've been expecting. And so therefore, we need to say, what does the Bible say? And what does our pastor say or somebody else say? We want to stick with what the Bible says. I want to start with this message this morning from 1 Corinthians. I'm going to ask you, if you will, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. One verse of Scripture. I'm going to ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. One verse of Scripture, but it says a tremendous amount. It says, And so it is written... Now wait just a second. It is written. What does that mean? It means it's somewhere in the Bible. It's already been written. Jesus said it over and over throughout his ministry. Have you not read? Have you not heard? You hear, but you don't hear. We started out several months ago. Hear, O Israel. That means to listen and to obey. He says, as it is written, and if the New Testament repeats a verse of the Old Testament, it must be extremely important. It says, as it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving being. Spirit, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for the testimony that Paul gives to us in one of those uh, profound chapters of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15. It talks about more about the experience of heaven and what Paul glimpsed there and the, the future understanding of where we will be and 
how we'll be taken up into heaven and all the other experiences dealing with future events of our life as Christians. But here he gives to us, as it is written, that the first Adam was a life-giving Adam. But he was a living being. But the second Adam is giving us a living spirit that dwells in us. Father, we thank you for these powerful words. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. It says there, and so it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Genesis, all the way back to the book of Genesis. In fact, there are several books in the Bible that you need to study. Genesis is one of those. It sets the foundation. If you have, uh, I know some of you do building and house construction and, and uh, uh, some of you like uh, Larry has made a sacrificial uh, uh, offering, a, a blood sacrifice just recently as he was working. Uh, but you build a house, you have got to start with a firm foundation. In, um, uh, I think it's uh, Ohio, uh, at the University of Ohio, some of you, I don't know if you're a... Uh, backer of the University of Ohio, Ohio State, I guess. There is a building called Wexler Art Building. You walk into that building, and everything in that building looks funny. It does not fit a building. They have stairs going up to nothing. They have windows that are turned sideways. They have doors that you open up, and there's nothing there. It is one of those buildings that they said, we want to build a building that has no purpose. We want to build a building that has no rhyme or reason. It's not built on structural, well, maybe structural, but it's not built on anything that is pleasing to the eye. We want to build a building so that as we place all the stuff in there, these things will be the attractive part and not the building itself. And so they built everything oddly. But I can tell you this, if they had not built the foundation of that building upon principles of engineering, that building would no longer be standing. They had to build the foundation on the principles that are going to give them support that they can build the rest of that building on. You can Google it and look it up. I think it's called the Wexler Building. The foundation is necessary, and the book of Genesis is our foundational book. If you don't understand the book of Genesis, you ought to read it till you do, because it's one of the simplest books to understand. It gives us the basis for our why we're here and where we came from and who created us. And there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, God breathed into... Actually, it says that God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. He took him from earth. He made him. We're not made from stardust as... uh, 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 Some of these scientists say, uh, you know, uh, some of those uh, well-known scientists that believe in atheism, they say, oh, the universe is all there is, all there ever will be, and uh, all there ever has been. And some of those, oh, there is no God. And they say, oh, we're made of stardust. You are stardust. Baloney. I am made of earth, materials from this earth. Adam was formed out of the dust of the ground. And then God breathed into him the breath of life, into his nostrils, the breath of of life, and man became a living soul. You and I are a soul being. I'm a soul man. I'm a soul man. Yeah, no, that's the wrong soul. Uh, We are a living soul, and therefore God has breathed into us his spirit. Now, you and I have a problem. When Adam and Eve sinned, that spiritual nature of God died in us and therefore we don't have the recognition that Adam and Eve had. I know I've mentioned this before, but this is so important. In this very room, right this very moment, there are spiritual beings that you can't see. You say, well, Pastor... I only believe, I believe in science. I only believe the things that I can see or that my senses can tell me. You're missing half of it. 
You're missing, no, you're missing a whole lot more than half. Coming into this room right now are all types of gamma radiation from outer space. Also into this room right now are TV waves, radio waves. If you had a receiver of a radio, you could tune it to that right frequency and you would get that frequency or you would get the sound coming in. You've got to have the right receiver. And many people say, I don't believe there is a God because I can't see Him. Well... There's a whole lot more ways to recognize God than just through sight or smell or taste and touch. In fact, your five senses that we call our, our major five senses, they are very misleading. Uh, and they can be deceiving. And so it's a dangerous thing. In fact, um, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther said... Uh, 500 and something years ago. He said, feelings come and feelings go. And feelings can be deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, naught else is worth believing. You and I have a limited acknowledgement of what's going on around us. We don't have a clue of what's going on and what all that God is doing. In the Old Testament, when Elijah was being attacked by the, Syri uh, by the Syrian army, uh, Elijah was there, and uh, uh, he was standing there, or he was in his house. His servant, they knew that Elijah had made a prediction. Uh, it's Elisha, I believe. He, he said he made a prediction that Syria was going to do something. And so they hated Syria, or Syria hated uh, Elijah. He came to kill Elisha. I keep saying Elijah. He came to kill Elisha. The servant went outside, Elijah's servant went out and said, Look, he saw all of the host of the army of Syria, thousands upon thousands gathered there. And he goes back in and he says, Look, we're, we're surrounded. There's no hope for us. We're going to die. And he prayed, Elijah fell on his knees and prayed. He says, Lord, open his eyes that he may see that those that are with us are greater than those that are against us. And so he went back outside and he saw, he saw the same Syrian army here, but now all along the mountaintops. They had been there present all along, but now for the very first time he was able to see what he had not been able to see before. The very host, the army of heaven was present there. You and I are surrounded by a lot of spiritual beings. You and I don't have a clue because... When Adam and Eve sinned, that spiritual receiver died. And you say, well, we're in trouble. Yes, we are. But there is a way we can recover that. The Bible tells us that when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, He gives to you His Spirit. He is a life-giving Spirit. And His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes and dwells in each and every one of us. And therefore, we need to be reactive to His Holy Spirit. Maisie's back there. We got, sometimes we have a little baby. There may be some babies in the nursery, I just don't know. Those little babies, when they, they're born, especially if, if they're what we would say a nurse might say, oh, they're perfect. They've got ten fingers, ten toes, a nose, a mouth, two eyes, two ears. Oh, they're, they're perfect. But that little baby, when they're first born, they don't have, they can't start typing on a computer. They can't pick up an instrument such as a spoon and hold it and feed themselves. There's got to be someone alongside that's going to teach them and show them the proper way to start doing things. So we're born, when you are born again of the Spirit, because He is the life giver, He is the life spirit giver, that's who the second Adam is. He is the Spirit giver. When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, the Spirit of God immediately comes into your heart into your mind, will, and emotions, and He takes precedence in your life. Now, just like a little baby, you don't know how to utilize all of that. 
You've got to be taught. And that's what the Word of God is all about. The Word of God is our instruction book on how the Spirit of God is supposed to live inside of us. I'm going to do it real quick. I know uh, my time's pushing, so I'm going to do it real quick here. Let me just go to my notes so I can cut it down. Uh, If you'll jump to uh, number five, slide number five. The Bible tells us that Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. When you accept Jesus Christ, you are born of the Holy Spirit. You were born physically when you were given birth to by your mom, but you are born again when the Spirit of God, when you accept Jesus Christ, confess your sins, He comes into your life, and there you are what the Bible would call saved or Christian, however you want to phrase it. The Spirit becomes alive in you. The second thing says that Jesus was baptized by the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 3, it says, When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice from heaven cried out and said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God did this on several occasions. The Holy Spirit baptized. He was present. He's a part of that. In fact, when you're baptized... For those of you that have been into this particular baptismal pool, if you haven't, wherever you were baptized, usually the structure is, as it says there in Matthew chapter 28, um, go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Usually when I baptize, I will say, uh, I baptize you, my sister. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, what we're doing is we're saying that not, I, I'm not, when I've dunked them in the water, that doesn't mean they're getting the Spirit right then. It means that when they accepted Jesus Christ, the Spirit, the life-giving person of Jesus Christ, the second Adam, He gives to us that Spirit, and the Holy Spirit baptizes us immerses us completely in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, we start discerning things that we didn't see before. Now, can I see angels? No. I was with, I may have told you this, I can't remember. I was with a guy when he was passing away. Uh, I was back in the bedroom with them. And he said, do you see all these people that are here? I said, no, I don't see anybody. He said, they've come for me. Um, in fact, I told this story and mentioned his name one place. And one of the guys that's a friend of mine said, well, I'm related to him through, through marriage. This was back in the 80s. He says, but I see them. He was given the privilege there a few minutes before he died. He was able to see things that you and I cannot see. Third thing, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4 Verses 1 and also in 14 says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. I didn't, don't tell y'all, but he was led to the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. But then when he came back out, Jesus then returned. This is 14 verses later. He returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and news of him went throughout all the surrounding regions. So the Holy Spirit was instrumental. In fact, now don't throw me out of the church just yet. Listen to me. I believe that Jesus, when he was here on this earth, I believe he was fully God. But he didn't work miracles under his own power. He could have. He was God. But what he did was, he. in fact, if you read many of the places where it says that he did a miracle, it says... The Spirit of God did the miracle for him. And the reason he did that was he could have done it himself since he is God, but he wanted to utilize and explain to us and illustrate to us if you're a human being like you and I, we're just a being after the first Adam. But if we want to be a a life-giving, we have the Spirit of God that's dwelling in us. We have the same power that Jesus Christ has dwelling inside of us, the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I can't do the things that Jesus did. Well, Jesus told him, said, if you've got the faith, you can do it. You can even move mountains, he told his disciples. And I believe that reaches to us. You and I 
don't utilize the power that the Holy Spirit has given to us by dwelling inside of us. That same Spirit that gave the miracles to Jesus, that raised the dead, made the lame to walk, made the blind to see, all of that the Holy Spirit did. And therefore, you and I, if you believe what the Bible says, then the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. And we too could do that. But our faith is weak. Jesus being God was perfect. His faith was strong. As we talked about it just a couple of weeks ago, he prayed there in the garden. He said, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. You see, you and I have been given the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus displayed the kingdom of God. It says there in Luke chapter 4, it says, The Spirit of the Lord, and this is, uh, this is when Jesus is in Nazareth. He's sitting in the synagogue. He's just been baptized in the Jordan River. He's walked uh, uh, the 40 or 50 miles back up to where uh, Nazareth, where he grew up. It is the Sabbath day. He comes to the synagogue. They said, oh yeah, uh, this is Jesus. He's uh, from Nazareth. He's from here. They gave him the scroll from the book of Isaiah. Actually, the Jews still do this today. They have a, a, a daily scripture portion that they read. And they read that every day, every year, on a certain day, they will read the very same scripture over and over, year after year, so that these are important events in their life and they want to remember. Jesus, on that particular day that he walked in the synagogue, he was handed a scroll from the book of Isaiah, which was the daily portion, and Jesus stood up as we stand up and read, and he says there, the, here's what he quoted from our, read from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord. Now, Jesus did something here. In Isaiah, it has two statements. Actually, they're, they're written all together. The statement is what I just read, the first part. The second part says that he is going to, that this is the year of vengeance, and God is going to judge the people of the world. Jesus didn't read that. After he read the first half of the portion, some people said, well, he's not through. He's not through. He's got to read the rest of it. Jesus sat down and he said, Today you have heard, the words that you have heard have been fulfilled in your very presence, in your very hearing. You know what they wanted to do? You know what he was claiming? He says, I'm the anointed of God. I am the one. The anointed of God means the Messiah, which we call Christ. It's the Messiah is the Hebrew word. Christ is the English word. It means the same thing. It means the anointed one. Jesus was claiming right here. He says, I am him. I am the one that came to raise the dead, that came to make the blind see, to proclaim liberty to those that are in bondage, and to set the captives free. And today you have heard the reading. You have seen it fulfilled in your very lives. You know what they want to do? They took him out to a hill outside of Nazareth. They were getting ready. I've been on top of that hill. Nazareth, from down below, you can see uh, to the uh, east, you can see uh, the mountain, the precipice there. They took him that very same... We're standing on the edge of this cliff uh, last January, a year ago, and our, um, our guy that was... He had his drone with him. So he flew the drone out there and made our picture standing on the edge of the precipice. They're getting ready to throw Jesus off because he has blasphemed. He has claimed that he is the anointed of God, that he is the Messiah. And the Bible says that Jesus just passed through them. Jesus went to proclaim the kingdom. And you and I, if you have the life spirit that's inside of you, if you have been born again, if you have been called of God to be one of His own children, you have also been given the great commission, and that is to share the news of the kingdom to a lost 
and dying world. Those people that will be caught as a thief in the night. Those people that will be surprised when Jesus Christ comes back. Even Christians, many of them that will be surprised because Jesus didn't come exactly the way they expected Him to. They're going to be shocked. They're going to be disappointed. But you and I, if you are a born-again child of God, we have been called to proclaim the kingdom of God to the world. You say, well, if I start doing that, people think I'm crazy. Folks, if the world, listen, if the world who thinks that there are 45 different genders, if the world who thinks that you can change from a man to a woman, if the world thinks that there once was nothing here and all of a sudden the world came into existence by a big bang, even though it might be 12 or 14 billion years ago, if the world who is crazy enough to believe that a man can become pregnant, if they're dumb enough to believe that, I don't care if they think I'm crazy. Because if I believe Jesus Christ, if I believe His Word, that crazy group over there, which I know that they have turned their back on God completely, and they are controlled. Now you say, well, Pastor, how do you know? The Bible teaches us that in the latter days, actually all the days, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against powers, principalities. We are wrestling against demonic forces when the crazy world out there that claims that they are doing good, that they love people, they want to protect lives, but yet they kill a million or so babies every year by abortion. When they do that, I don't want to be in that number. I want to be a part of what God says. Your children of the light. You need to know better. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I know that sometimes when I say that, every eye closed and every head bowed, some people say, oh, he's getting ready to finish. Yes, I'm getting ready to finish. But I don't want God to be finished. I don't want God to ever finish what he's doing. He is the, he is the second Adam. He is the spirit giver. Adam, you and I are related to the first Adam because you and I are a human being. The word Adam means mankind. We are a part of mankind, directly descended from Adam. But also this. If you are a born-again child of God, then you have been given the Spirit. Jesus, the second Adam, he is the Spirit giver and he has given you the spirit he's baptized you hopefully in the Holy Spirit he's filled you with the Holy Spirit and you have been called to proclaim the kingdom of heaven and if we as a church as Ebenezer Baptist Church if we're not doing that then we are worthless you say pastor how can you say that we're taking care of our, our people here. Folks, people that are already Christians, if all we're doing is praying for them, and I know we've got some sickness, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. But if all we're doing is praying for those that are already Christians to get well so they won't die and go to heaven, then we're doing wrong. We ought to be on our knees begging because it says there, and the youth talked about it just a couple of nights ago on Sunday night. They said the fields are white into harvest. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers. Those that will gather. Those that will water the fields. Those that will plant the seeds of the word of God. Those that will gather and teach the word so that the harvest will be ready when Jesus Christ comes. If all we're wanting to do is be a part of Ebenezer Baptist Church so we can take care of ourselves, so we can, you know, feel good about ourselves, you know, I love you. And as a minister of the gospel of Christ, i got to tell you the truth. That's not what the church does. Church comes together to worship, but we leave these doors to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
God is speaking to you, I want to invite you to come in just a moment. Whatever it is, I know sometimes people are hesitant about coming down to the front, talking to the pastor or whatever. Uh, don't be afraid. Uh, you know, in the Billy Graham Crusades, they have a lot of workers. When Billy Graham used to give the invitations for, uh, and even Franklin Graham, when he gives an invitation to come to, people get up and start moving right then. You say, wow, look at that. Just the, his voice got people to move. <laughs> Most of those, or many of those, are workers that have said, or they have been taught, said, when the invitation is given, if you will get up and walk down to the front and be prepared, praying that God is going to send you someone to witness to, other people who have a lack of nerve or a little bit of fear in their life, they will also be encouraged to come down and walk also. But we as a church, we sit still. We don't do anything. And many people that say, you know, I'd like to move, but nobody else does. I'm afraid to. Then we have taken that incentive away from them. But if God is speaking to you for salvation, if you want to make sure we're living in a dangerous world right now, a dangerous world. If you don't believe it, watch the news. Israel is about to explode. I don't know. Am I saying that World War III is going to start? I don't know. I, it will eventually. I've read the Battle of Armageddon there in the, in the book of Revelation. I know it's going to happen. I just don't know when. But I want to be prepared because I want to be a son of the light. If God is speaking to you, salvation, rededication, maybe church membership, whatever the need is, if God is speaking to you, we invite you to come as we sing. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts now. Give us courage to make a decision for you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.